You're listening to the Face Valley Podcast, episode 168. Will getting plastic surgery mean I'm anti-fat? We've got some listener questions today. Let's do it. Perfect. Hello and welcome, fierce fatties and fat allies. Excited to have you here. I just had a sip of tea and it was the most perfect sip of tea. Perfect temperature, perfect amount of steeped. Mm. Oh yeah, I think we're going to have to cancel the podcast so I can just sip on this tea. It's magnificent. Let's put the, let's put the lid on so we can keep the perfect temperature i've got a yeti um mug that was given to me i never thought about anything to do with uh you know fancy mugs before it's expensive it's like i don't know 40 bucks I don't know. <laughs> it sounds expensive to me it is amazing it is life <laughs> honestly it's life-changing if you're on the wall about getting a yeti mug i don't know if i'm new to this mug game thing or people are like Yeti is old news, or there's better ones than Yeti that are cheaper, whatever. But this Yeti, you know, I'm telling people about it. I've had it for a few months now, and it's just perfection. To the point where I don't even use any other mugs in my house anymore. Anyway, today's episode, we've got some listener questions. Um, We've got so many, I'm going to do a double episode. So, uh, listener question next week too. Um, I sent an email out saying, hey, what questions you got? And um, you responded. So if you're not on my email list, oh, what are you doing? I think we've got, I don't know, maybe 6,000, 7,000, 5,000, a million. I don't know. <laughs> that was six, seven, 5,000, something like that. Um, on there. And so, yeah, if you're not already an email subscriber, go to my website and just um, sign up for any of the freebies and you'll become a subscriber will become a subscription and you get an email every week with what the podcast is so that's good and you'll also get random emails like me saying here's a picture of a dog and tell me your questions and stuff like that so yeah so where we're at with the Kofi if you know listening to the podcast I've been um doing like a Patreon type thing but it's called Kofi it's better than Patreon and the goal is to get to $680 hairs a month, $680 a month, um, in order to pay for the podcast. So, and so that's four episodes a month. This month, the last 30 days, we are at $285 hairs. So we need, we, we, I want to get to 680. And, uh, so, we're at episode 168 now. So 164, episode 164, we're at 26 subscriptions. That's 26 people, which was 170 a month. At episode 166, so two episodes later, we're at 27 subscriptions and 175 a month. And now 168, we're at 29 subscriptions and 185 a month. So... Uh, and I said 285 because then we got some one-off donations too, 100 bucks of one-off donations. So if you subscribe, you get loads of cool shit. Um, I'm thinking as well as well, adding in. So we've got the Size Diversity Resource Guide, which is amazing. Actually, do we already have that in there? I'll have to double check. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I think I already have. Um, yeah, I did put clothes in. I was going to say, let's add in the clothes one because I've got um myself and my VA for years have been working on this thing honestly years been working on it and we've got clothes in there and there's lists of hundreds of places to shop their price range links to the website um what type of clothes they are la 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 and so it's amazing um you can get that for five bucks as a subscription what are you waiting for? It's so good. All right. So questions. Just quick, quick uh, apology. Last last uh, podcast, I think it was a bit loud because I had all my windows open because it's getting H-O-T warm in Vancouver. 
so I'm all my windows open. Um, but I have less windows open today and a fan on me and also I'm wearing less clothes. So hopefully it's not going to be as loud. Or maybe my video editor made it sound less loud. I don't know. Maybe you might be like, what the fuck are you talking about? But hey, we just heard your voice. But anyway, uh, if you've got a question for the show, you can always email me. Um, Vinny at fiercefatty.com. Um, can't guarantee that I'll answer all the questions because some of them might be things that I just covered or, you know, covered in the last episode or whatever. And you just happen not to have known that that's what I was talking about. Um, and also sometimes uh, the, when people are emailing me, they, a lot of people don't ask, ask an actual question. So they tell me about this like big complicated story and I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And then they don't have a question. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the question is about this. So I can't answer the question if there's no question. So make sure if your question is not on, answered in this episode, if you want to reply back and then add a question to your whatever you're saying versus just a statement. Beautiful. Love that. I think maybe sometimes people forget and they're just like, this is what's happening in my life. And it's easy to, to forget maybe. Um, okay. So we're going to start with a question from Jennifer who says... This is so, so I read these questions and I thought about them for a day and, and some of them I was like, they're sticking in my mind. And so I'm like, they're juicy. I need to, I need to ask, answer them. Okay. So hi, Vinny. I'm comfortable with my fat body, but after years and years and years of weight cycling, I have significant skin laxity under my chin slash neck and arms. I've done so much work around fat acceptance and loving my body as it is, but I'm thinking of getting plastic surgery. I just want to feel like I look like my age and can confidently wear my gorgeous plus size clothes. How can I have plastic surgery and still be fat and body positive? Thank you so much. So excellent question from Jennifer. This is really good. And I have so much compassion for how you're feeling right now. And I'm, I'm really sorry that you're, you're struggling, uh, Jennifer. It sounds really difficult. Um, and so first off, it's your body. You can do it, whatever the fuck you like to it, right? So um, I don't think that you're seeking my permission or anything, but just like an FYI, if anyone's listening, thinking like, do we have Vinny's permission? <laughs> like you're all probably right there. <laughs> you're, all, you're all probably every day being like, do I have Vinny's permission? <laughs> it's definitely what you're thinking. Uh, but you do what you want to your own body. No one else gets to say, right? Um, but I think the question is, how can I have plastic surgery and still be fat and body positive? So, so let's, let's break this down. Um, so Jennifer has said, I've done so much work around fat acceptance and loving my body as it is. And previous to that, uh, Jennifer said, it's been, I, I was uh, weight cycling for years and years and years, which leads me to believe that most of Jennifer's life was, was weight cycling, right? And more recently, it's been stopping the dieting, becoming fat positive, and all that jazz, right? And I, but I'm not sure how long. So um, let's presume you're my age. I don't know, 38. However old I am. Am I 38 or 30, no, 30, no, I'm 38. Yeah. Or 30, am I 37? No, I'm 38. Yeah, I'm 38. Let's just pres presume you're 40. Um, that's our, an average age. Would that be the average age? I guess people live to like close to 90 now, right? So let's say 44. Who the fuck knows? Anyway, so that means, theoretically, you might have been dieting for 20, 30 years. And that means, theoretically, you've stopped dieting for maybe a handful of years. I don't know. Um, so let's just make those assumptions because we're not sure exactly. Um, so that means that you have had decades of believing and being indoctr indoctrinated heavily into dieting is good, fatness is bad, right? And then we've had a little bit of time, however much it is. And in that time, you, you could have done a lot of stuff. But a little bit of time compared to the time of the anti-fat indoctrination, 
it's it's kind of if we think about um a scale you know like one side is the anti-fat stuff and then one side is the fat positive stuff the anti-fat stuff is really outweighing the fat positive stuff right and not saying that you need to have another you know 10 20 30 40 years of fat positivity before you feel more confident but just like a heads up of that's a lot that you went through right that's a lot of programming and a lot of time believing something and then comparatively a shorter time where you we you, you've changed your mind um and so giving ourselves that patience and as well the thing is i talked about this in the cults episode i did an episode on cults uh, and diet culture being a cult um when you leave most cults society as a whole is like whoo thank fuck you're out of that that was really harmful for you well we that sucked how can we help you recover generally speaking very generally speaking whereas diet culture when you leave that cult people are like you should get back in <laughs> why are you leaving that cult that cult was good for you just try harder in the cult so it's not like you're walking into this welcoming world. You're walking into a world which has pockets of, of welcoming in the fat positivity and anti-diet communities. But most of it is, you know, telling you you should go back in to anti-fatness and diet culture. So our environment is not that supportive um, versus other instances of being convinced about a certain way of, of thinking. So when you say, I've done so much work around fat acceptance and loving my body as it is, is what Jennifer says, I wonder what that means exactly. Like, what is significant work? Um, is it that you've gone to therapy for years and you've, you've um, uh, enrolled in a fat positive course or you've uh, learned intuitive eating with a health every size dietitian or you've... Um, read lots of books and podcasts and things like that. Um, and I wonder if, as well, you've done a lot of stuff around focusing on skin positivity and fat arms and fat chins, or whether a lot of the stuff that you might be looking at is fat people in... in um, socially acceptable fat bodies, so young fat people, um, smaller fat people, white fat people, non-disabled fat people, etc. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, because a lot of, a lot of uh, clients, when I talk to them, I'll say, so tell me, you know, like, tell me what you're surrounded by. Like, what, what types of things do you, do you watch? What types of uh, people do you follow? And they'll say, oh, yeah, I, I, um, I follow a lot of really diverse people. And so I say, let's do a little experiment. Let's take out your phone and tell me out of the first 10 posts that come up on whatever app that you're using, like Instagram normally, who, what types of bodies are you seeing? And often they'll say, oh, we've got a thin white dietitian, who, but they are intuitive eating. So that's good. So yeah, that's good. We've got another thin white dietitian. We've got a plus size model. We've got a... Um, a post about recipes and so it'll kind of be a mix of things it won't be that radical f fat liberation stuff it won't be like oh here's a uh, a queer disabled uh black content creator who talks about uh colorism and oh the next post is a fat dietitian who is autistic and talks about uh food insecurity and racism in in food production you know right um and so people kind of go in a little bit light which is fine which is you know it's, it, you we don't normally go into a new movement and be like okay give me all the, the most radical things because we don't know about it it's maybe it might be a little bit overwhelming a little bit scary um because you know we're, we're still t um tied to diet culture and so a lot of the times seeing people who are in bodies that are a little bit less confronting it's easier to get information from them. That's why we have a lot of um, thin, white, non-disabled dietitians um, who have big platforms because they're not, they help us buy into anti-fatness, but in a way that is 
less anti-fat than a dietitian who is straight out fat phobic, right? You know, we're still kind of in our brain. So they might they might not be saying anything anti-fat. They might, might be fat positive themselves, but they might be um, in the back of our brains. We're thinking, oh, if we follow what they say, maybe I'll become thin. You know, it's like an unconscious thing. So anyway, 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 anyway. So I don't know the answers to this for, for Jennifer of how much, what does I've been... Um, I've done so much work around fat acceptance. So like, what does that mean? And as well with um, skin elasticity, um, is that something that, you know, there's lots of, there's different accounts of people um, who, who talk about that and differences with skin and, and people who have conditions. There's one person that I'm thinking of and I can't remember their handle um, and they have a condition where they um, age prematurely and so um, their skin has tons of elasticity and she's like, famous and loves her skin now um and, but not saying that you have to do that so i'm just curious i'm just cu- i'm just curious around that stuff what does that mean and jennifer might be listening and being like vinnie i've done all of that stuff listen up hey uh, i've been in therapy for years listen i've done so much stuff great perfect wonderful and also even you haven't that's fine right um, and also here's another thing that people get into is I talk, spoke about it, s- spoke, I spoke about it last episode, which is constant learner mode, which is, um, doing a lot of reading and listening and uh, absorbing information, which is beautiful. Love it. But also we need to take action because we cannot learn to embody confidence or, or bravery without also taking action and action in a way that is supportive. So not, you know, going and doing something that's super scary and traumatizing um and i use the example if you wanted to learn how to swim you could read lots of books about it but there's no way that you'd know how to swim unless you actually got into the water but don't jump into the deep end because you might drown and you might traumatize yourself but support yourself by going to the shallow end and just tinkling your toes a little bit um so have you been doing that stuff the the action too have you been setting goals around like okay i'm gonna um I don't know, wear a sleeveless top for 10 minutes while I pick up a pint of milk or whatever and then run back in and be like, oh God, you know, something like that. Uh, so Jennifer says, but I'm thinking of getting plastic surgery, even though um, Jennifer's done a lot of work. So the work hasn't, the work you've done hasn't helped you remove that distress that you're feeling um, when you see your skin. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's distressing. And I use that word distress and, you know, to, 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 um, to get plastic surgery, I know, you know, I not, I don't know, I've not had surgery, but you know, from what I know about any type of surgery, it's a big thing. So it makes me think that this is something that's really distressing for you. Right. Um, and a question to consider is how much do we can continue to work on fat acceptance before we use body modification there is no kind of everyone might be different and there's no right or wrong um thing so for some people it's zero work right some people engage in body modification if they don't like themselves so not coming from a uh, from a positive um body modification you know coming from a i don't like myself um or um not something that's gender affirmation or anything like that but um so say in, in Jennifer's situation, someone in Jennifer's situation, they might decide to do zero work and then also get plastic surgery. And that's fine, right? And for some time, for some people, it could be a lifetime of work and then deciding, you know, I'm not going to get surgery because, you know, due to, due to the principle of what that would mean is that I'm buying into anti-fatness. Um, and also, you know, I've decided surgery is too risky for me or whatever. And I, and I've decided that I'm able to live with my body the way it is. My distress is not so much that I can't live with it. But for some people, it's too distressing and it's not uh, a possibility to live with it. Right. So wherever you're at on that spectrum, you know, everyone's going to be different. Right. So I feel like, you know, there's there's the pros and the cons of of having surgery right um you know the one side we go back to the scales on one side you've got all the distress that this is causing you so you you, so you've said you know you you 
you uh we've not said i don't like my self you just said i'm thinking about getting plastic surgery um and then on the other side i just want to feel like i look my age okay so you want to look your age and so on the other side of that that might be ageism right and then one side is okay if i get the surgery jennifer says i can confidently wear my gorgeous plus size clothes and i just want to say ask is that true or will there maybe be something else that comes up or are you like no it's just it's just this loose skin it's nothing else i know that this is not going to be a i get this and then i say oh no my tummy's too big and then i get that and then i say oh no um and that might be a clue that maybe spending a little bit more time with your mental health might be helpful um and so, yeah, think about, you know, on the, the pros and cons for doing this. And what is stopping you from having the surgery? I'm not saying that you should have the surgery or that the surgery is good. But, you know, what is it? Is it, the question is, can I have plastic surgery and still be fat and body positive? Is, is it shame? Is it fear of letting the community down? Is it fear that people are going to reject you, the people that you respect, the fat positive people that they're going to say, oh no, Jennifer's gone and had this surgery. This means that she hates fat people. Is that, is that what's stopping you? Or is there something else? Because, you know, people are going to judge you, right? People are going to People who are not fat, po- fat positive are going to judge you. People who are fat positive are going to judge you. People who are fat positive are going to say, that's cool that you did something for yourself. And that people who are not fat positive will say the same thing, right? So other people's opinions don't really matter. So I wonder like what this is about. Like why, like what is it that you need? What is it you need to hear? Um, and the thing is, right, we all engage in body modifications to feel more confident. Um, and more like ourselves for many different reasons and some of those reasons are based on anti-fat beliefs some of those reasons are to appease the patriarchy or white supremacy and some are due to things like gender dysphoria or gender confirmation and and it's complicated right and there's some ways that we view view body modification as just no big deal Um, and other ways it's seen as betraying yourself or betraying goodness you know or or being morally superior that I don't crumble to, crumble under the uh, the weight of anti-fatness or ageism or beauty ideals, right? And that kind of moral superiority that some people might feel because of that. So your question, how can I have plastic surgery and still be fat and body positive? Something that, that came up when I read that is is when I was on the BBC, I was on the BBC show and one of my fellow hat fat, Uh, happy fat people got a lot of criticism because she wears a lot of makeup she looks amazing um and people were saying well how can you really love yourself if you wear makeup like expressing herself with makeup meant that she hated fat people or didn't like herself and i was just like what what's one got to do with the other what beliefs would you maybe need to hold if you had this surgery like what what is behind this is it, is it anti-fatness? Is it a way to express yourself? Is it a way for you to feel more at home in your body? And if it's something like, I don't like the look of this skin because it makes me look bigger or it's bad um, and I'm bad because of it, that could be beliefs that are based in bias. And so that's an opportunity to overcome those beliefs because that bias is not going to go away with surgery. But you could feel a lot more comfortable. And also something to consider is that what we do to try and survive and thrive in this violently fat phobic world is our business, right? If you need to do, you know, anything, Jennifer, to to thrive and survive, really, people don't get to have a say, right? It's up to you. So, you know, if you don't already, I would suggest having a chat with a therapist. I mean, I think everyone should be able to have access to support with mental health. Uh, you might not be able to, to access that. Um, but, you know, even if it's like, why, what is my hesitation and working through that type of stuff? Yeah. So, 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 so. And then if you do get the, the, the surgery, you know, 
It's got nothing to do with me or anyone else. And when I think about loose skin on arms and on under the chin, I just, you know what I think about? I think about all of the awesome videos that you could make with hilarious messages, right? Like I think about like if you had your arm out and you had l l loose skin, you could like tuck it behind your arm and then you could be like, this is what I say to people who think that my loose skin is, is bad. And then you could un unrelease the arm flap and so then the, and then on the arm flap it could say something like fuck you like, <laughs> like I just think about stuff like that and people embracing that stuff or you know when people do the thing under the chin and they'll have a fuck you you know and so it'd be like oh you you should be more pretty or whatever and then they do a d their double chin and, and then the fuck you comes out I need to do I need to make a post like that like and I just think iconic iconic so i mean you know maybe there's a way for you to embrace this and turn this into your thing and be like yeah man i've got these fucking amazing like wings on my arms and and like this 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 cool neck and and you know what it is this feels like this feels like my survival this is this shows what i've what what my my brain has been through what my body has been through and i'm still here my body's still rocking and surviving and and that might be helpful or not you could be like no that's no <laughs> no i'm not making a video with my arm flap and you know putting it down and it's saying fuck you that's not my thing um yeah so so anyway jennifer you do you you do you and i think i think you probably already um have thought about this already if you do have the surgery i think that a, a big thing would be not not to be like hey everybody look at me and my my smaller arms and i'm great and you're not you know or, hey, you should get surgery. And I don't think that, that would be at all anything that Jennifer would do because obviously Jennifer's question is, is thoughtful. But, you know, if anyone else is out there being like, <laughs> I'm going to decide to turn into a dick if I have smaller arms. Um, maybe don't. <laughs> Not that any of my listeners would do that. No, because you're all amazing. Mm, another sip of that delicious tea, which is still at the perfect temperature because I put the lid on. Okay, next question is from Haley. One question I have is how to incorporate the word fat as a neutral descriptor in conversation. And also a few quick responses or phrases to say when people wince at the use of the word or try to change the word for their comfort. Thanks, Haley. Yeah, I see this all the time. Um, especially when I'm doing training, which is not necessarily related to fatness, because I do DEI training, diversity, equity and inclusion training. And then when we get to the fat section and I talk about fat stuff or I say my business is called Fierce Fatty or I describe myself as fat, you could see people being like, <laughs> don't say that. You're not fat, you're beautiful. Pretty sure I'm fucking buzz. And so I always say, hey, you may have heard me use the word fat. Just so that you're aware, fat is a neutral descriptor and it is something that the fat liberation community has reclaimed and it doesn't mean any of the negative things that we've been told that it means. Um, so that's my quick and, quick and, quick and dirty thing. But um, if I was in conversation with someone, I would just be using the word fat. I'd just be, you know, if, I mean, if anyone asked me what I did or whatever, um... And if you are, hey, he says, how can I incorporate the word fat as a neutral descriptor? If you get the chance to talk about fatness, just do it. Just do it. And and even if people don't react, just be like, hey, by the way, just so you know, I'm not being a dick. Fat is a neutral word and uh, is no big deal. And uh, what I also say is if I say, if you're not yet comfortable with this word and this use using this word for yourself, there's alternative words that you can use that aren't stigmatizing, like higher weight or bigger body. What we do need to avoid is using the O words, and then you can educate them on what the O words are. If people don't know, it's obese and overweight and why they're problematic. Um, another thing that I like doing is I like asking people questions. Like, why? Why, why shouldn't we say that? What's mean? Why? Do you, do you think that being fat is bad? Well, I, uh, no, but it's a mean word. Why? What do you hear when I say the word fat? Oh, I hear like unattractive. Is it unattractive to be fat? Well, no, but 
isn't that what you're saying when you say fat? No, I'm using it as a neutral descriptor. And by using it, it's losing all of that negative uh, power that has historically been thrust behind that word. By using it, I am uh, reclaiming it and just using it as a neutral or even positive descriptor. I'm fat. I love being fat. There's nothing wrong with the word fat. And if people want to say that someone is ugly or unhealthy or lazy or whatever, then they can use those words. But that sounds like a very unkind person. I know you're not an unkind person. Um, So let's just get used to saying the word fat. It's the the word that we're going to be using moving forward. Um, So, you know, it's 2023 and this is the language that we're using now. Um, Yeah. Uh, another one, like one of my favorite times when someone was like, oh, don't say that. I was at a, a, a singing group and someone said, oh, Finney has a book out this week called Fierce Fatty. And they were like, oh. and I said, yeah. What, they said, why did you call it that? Oh, because I'm fat. And, you know, it's amazing to be fat. I said, you're not fat. I said, I am. And they were like, no, you're not. And so I lifted my shirt, grabbed my belly and said, Am I not? <laughs> what is this then? And they were, their brain was like, uh, 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 like power down, don't know what to do because they didn't want to say, yes, you're fat because in their mind, they were saying, yes, you're unattractive. Yes, you're horrible. Yes, you're lazy. Yes, you're la 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 la. Right. And, and then I, you know, after, you know, they, I was like, hey, it's a neutral word, blah, blah, blah. So, um, I know maybe that stuck with them. Maybe they're, maybe they're terrified of ever meeting another fat activist because they might show their belly to them. Um, but yeah, for me, it's kind of just getting curious and then just talking to people. Um, yeah. Okay, so question from Amanda. Hi, Vinny. I absolutely adore you. Thank you. And the Face Fatty podcast. Oh, thank you. Here's my situation slash question. I was recently diagnosed with diabetes. Listening to amazing fat positive resources like Fierce Fatty has taught me that a diagnosis like this isn't about my weight. You're right. As thin people can have diabetes too. Absolutely. And not all fat people have diabetes. Nail on the head, Amanda. However, my doctor seems to disagree and blamed everything on the O word. Even though I brought up my family history, I've been going to this doctor for a long time and have generally trusted her, but her delivery of this news really threw me for a loop. I'm having a hard time reconciling information from a doctor I usually trust with information I've heard from well-researched books and podcasts about how O-word is bullshit. How do we trust our healthcare providers when the majority of them still believe in the outdated racist sexist BMI? By the way, the first thing she said after giving me my diagnosis was, good news, you can take a Zempic, which will help with weight loss. <laughs> I think she expected me to be excited, but I'm proud of myself for being weirded out instead. Uh, yes. Thank you so, so much for making this world a better place for fatties, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Such a lovely words. Um, and oh my goodness, I am so sorry this happened to you. Having a type 2 diabetes diagnosis at the best of times as a fat person is uh, potentially traumatizing, triggering, distressing, difficult, um, scary. But then having a diagnosis from a doctor who is committed to spreading anti-fat bias, um, non-evidence-based care and... uh, fucking just bullshit is is worse right luckily you were equipped when you went in there um with that amazing brain of yours to say "Hmm, this smells like bullshit sounds like bullshit could it be a bullshit yes 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 that's what it is um, your, your doctor sounds like a donkey, really. Honestly, I swear. Like, I don't, you know, I just, I genuinely don't understand. Because I'm thinking, if I was a doctor and I was telling someone a diagnosis, I would be like, hey, you know, I'm so sorry this has happened. And um, let's get you feeling better or whatever. I can't imagine being like, this is your fault, fatty. 
Maybe when I was really anti-fat. Honestly, yeah, I can see that. If I, When I used to be really anti-fat, I can imagine being on a high horse, being like, huh, they did this to themselves. And getting self-esteem from telling them off. I can imagine, yeah. I used to get a lot of self-esteem from feeling superior to others for things I deemed bad. Um, yeah, so even if fatness caused diabetes then she still shouldn't have shamed you as we know that shame is not good for our physical or mental health. Uh, so for those who are not as informed as Amanda on, on diabetes, um, I want to encourage you to go to Hayes health sheets and go to the diabetes one. So just scroll down and look at the health sheets, but I'll give you a little, uh, I'll give you a little taste. And so they have lots of different, um, diagnosis that are associated with fatness. Um, we don't know that they're caused by fatness. Um, and uh, so they have one on type 2 diabetes. So what is it? Type 2 diabetes is a condition that keeps your body from properly pro processing glucose, leading to a buildup of glucose in the blood. Diabetes occurs when the cells in, in the body have difficulty using insulin to turn glucose into fuel and when the pancreas and organ near the stomach and intestine does not make enough insulin. What causes it? A number of factors can contribute to an increased risk of type 2 diabetes including weight cycling, yo-yo dieting, aka any dieting, and internalized weight stigma. But type 2 diabetes is predominantly a genetic condition. So um, Amanda was saying it's, you know, it's in, it's in, my, uh, it's in my family. The doctor's like, eh. <laughs> uh, while much fat phobic and misinformation floats around, you cannot eat your way into type 2 diabetes and it affects people of all sizes. Let me repeat that. It's predominantly, 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 I've forgotten how to speak. Predominantly a genetic condition and you cannot eat your way into type 2 diabetes. Getting type 2 diabetes isn't your fault. It does not indicate that you have done anything wrong. It is simply a fairly common health condition. So um, this sheet goes on to how is it diagnosed? Um, how is it treated? Uh, what is What about pre-diabetes? I want to read the pre-diabetes thing here because m m people might not know um about prediabetes in a nutshell it's dog shit prediabetes is a controversial diagnosis that was strongly lobbied for by who do we think lobbied for this diagnosis get your guesses in come and shout them out to me who might have lobbied for for this diagnosis to be uh created did you say pharmaceutical companies yes you, yes uh, so strongly lo lobbied for by pharmaceutical companies, which are currently developing at least 10 drugs to treat this condition. Important things to know when discussing the validity of a pre-diabetes diagnosis is that the American Diabetes Association lowered the blood sugar threshold that is considered pre-diabetic in 2004 and lowered the hemoglobin A1C threshold in 2010, creating about 72 million new cases in the US. These changes were made without adequate research evidence and were later adopted by the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. Under the newest definition of pre-diabetes, about one in three people in the U.S. is considered to be pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. The majority of people with pre-diabetes do not progress to type 2 diabetes. And that number is, is tiny. I can't remember it now. It's like, is it? four percent or two percent let's be generous and say five percent that's how that you know a tiny percent of people progress to having type 2 diabetes because um <clears throat> it's a it's a bullshit of a condition uh there's no clear evidence that treatment for pre-diabetes impacts progression to diabetes Studies have not shown an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in those with prediabetes, and there is no clear evidence that treating prediabetes will decrease the risk of progression to diabetes. Uh, so it talks about how, how diabetes is treated and all the different things. Um, you know, 
None of them saying lose weight. So at the end, overall, blood sugar is complicated and it can be affected by many factors, including sleep and stress. Try to look at your treatment plan as an exploration of how your body works and how you can best support it rather than a reason to become obsessed with numbers and testing. Learning to trust the body, become familiar with its internal cues and focusing on behaviors rather than weight are crucial for improved health outcomes. It's important to know that type 2 diabetes can also be a progressive condition. That means that it's possible that what works now may become less effective over time. Remember that this is not your fault. It's just part of your health condition and your healthcare provider can support you in finding new solutions so imagine imagine if you went to the doctor and you heard that type of stuff if you were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes is not your fault it's largely a genetic condition you can't eat your way into diabetes and how we're going to treat it is we're going to um, treat it the same way that we would treat it if you were a small body person right Amanda's question is how do we trust our healthcare providers when the majority of them still believed in outdated racist sexist BMI? Well, we can't always, especially if we have other marginalized identities on top of that, especially if they happily and proudly espouse anti-fat beliefs. It's hard to, to trust providers who say that, you know, do those things. And like my doctor is, is anti-fat and luckily she doesn't bring it up that much um and luckily i have the that that level of knowledge that i can observe her saying these things and just be like huh that's interesting that she's saying that like she's just she's just saying it because that's just her script that's her spiel of you know to to fix this condition you need to lose weight and you need to do this and that and like, I just think it's just, you know, just automatic. And I just think about her brain and, and, and how she must think about herself. I'm kind of like more able to observe versus internalize. And also understand that she still knows, she knows a lot, right? She's able to prescribe me the things I need. And also I'm able to know if she prescribes me weight loss, but that is not an effective treatment. And so I can just be like, okay, well, that one treatment suggestion, that's not for me. Um, what other suggestions have we got? I'll do those other things, thank you. Um, so it's kind of like you have to edit, edit out, which sucks, right? Um, I mean, it would be amazing if you could find a fat positive provider. Chances of that happening? Uh, there are There are fat positive people out there. Um, and the training um, will will be tra will be changing. The training that um, healthcare providers go through. I mean, I go out and train healthcare providers about this stuff. So it's not like every single healthcare provider in the world is like, aha, I hate fat people. A lot of them are, but some do exist. Um, one thing you can do, by the way, if you don't know this, anyone listening, is you can talk to Dr. Asher from the Fat Doctor. Um, who offers consultations. Uh, Dr. Asher cannot prescribe medicine, cannot refer you to, to people, but will be able to talk to you about your condition and what treatment could look like for you and how you might be able to go about asking your doctor. Um, also, people can deep dive into fat positive diabetes resources if you want. Um, also, something else that you can do in, in a situation like this is, is protect yourself if you can during, uh, before and after a session. So when I say protecting yourself, it could be that you um, have, uh, you talk to a friend beforehand and say, hey, I'm really nervous about this. Or you post to social media or, or you're in a Facebook group and you say, hey, I'm really nervous about this. Any tips for me? When you go in, you could have a patient advocate with you or a friend. Uh, you can have what I do is I will write out a list on my phone of the things that I want to talk about because I will get flustered in a doctor's because, you know, they'll, you know, they can come out and say anything at any point And, you know, my brain will be like, shut down. <laughs> Not always, but I will write down a list if I've got things I need to say so that I can just refer to the list and not be, you know, put off by anti-fatness. 
Yeah. So think about how you could support yourself. Is it after the doctor's your appoint- appointment, you need to go and have a nap? Uh, do you need to go and uh, text a friend and say, I survived? Or do you need to make an appointment with Dr. Asher from the fact doctor to talk about the bullshit that you just experienced? Um, go to Dr. Asher's um, Instagram, the fat doctor, and you can book sessions from the link in the bio. No. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. I'm sorry you had to go through that. That's bullshit. It makes me think about when I got diagnosed with um, my thyroid, whatever it's called. Hashimoto's or whatever you know my, my thyroid doesn't work it's slow and the doctor said to me listen this diagnosis is not an excuse for you to be fat she shouldn't say fat she said the O word and I was like I was there reeling from this diagnosis because I, I, I you know I didn't really know what it meant and she was like you're gonna have to take tablets for the rest of your life and your your body is is attacking your thyroid and I was just like, oh my God, I was really upset about it. And then she says, it's not, this is not an excuse for you to be fat. And I was like, bitch, <laughs> I wasn't fat positive at the time, but I just thought, what? I've never not made an excuse to be fat. I'm, what? Just really stuck with me. And I was just like, that is really rude. Anyway, and it was just, you know, how, how, you know, how they could have been supportive you know, your doctor or my doctor could have been supportive and say, hey, this sucks. I'm sorry that you've experienced that. It's a manageable condition versus, you know, what, what, what I heard was like, you know, this is a terrible diagnosis. I wish I could go back to me there and be like, oh, you know, it's fine. Just take your tablets. You know? NBD, get some blood tests. You know, and that's my experience, right? Other people's experience might be different. Okay. So we have a question from Valerie. Hi, Vinny. Thanks for this opportunity. It's actually quite timely. I have a sensitive situation that has just happened a couple of days ago and I need to help feedback input on a, an appropriate response. So I'm an artist and I work at several large, long fairs during the summer months. The owner of the booth I'm currently working at only provides really cheap quality unsturdy chairs. I'm in a bigger body, so I always bring my own heavy duty quality made chair that is rated for me merited more than three times my weight. I purchased two of them. They were expensive, but I considered it a wise investment in my health, safety and comfort. This year, my sister-in-law is working in the booth as well. She happens to be larger than me, so I brought both my heavy-duty chairs so we both could each use one. She is nowhere near the chair's weight capacity. But by the end of the first day of the fair, her chair's front legs had bent and the chair seat was now slanted forward and low. I traded chairs with her, but at the end of the next day, the second chair was also bent. However, I also noticed that when she was sitting, her body was centered primarily near the front edge of the chair where it sticks out like a diving board instead of closer to the backrest where there is more structural support. This explained why the chairs bent. I didn't criticize her or shame her for what happened, but I've really had a hard time with this in my own head and thoughts. There are still two full weeks left of this fair, and obviously we couldn't continue using the chairs, but we also couldn't use the ones provided in the booth. We went to Lowe's early the next morning before work, and I bought two heavy-duty camping chairs. They were, even, they were even more expensive than my original chairs, which sadly are now trash. And since I'm currently broke, I don't get paid till after the end of the fair, I actually had to borrow money from my mum to pay for the chairs. My sister-in-law has not offered to help with the cost of buying new chairs, and at this time, I don't know if it's even appropriate for me to ask her to do so. I'm distressed about this whole thing. I feel so angry. And at the same time, I feel so ashamed for feeling this anger because it is body focused. But also, I think I might be less upset if she had even offered to help contribute to the cost of new chairs. Please, Vinny, I would greatly appreciate your perspective and input on this heart. Thanks, Valerie. Oh, wow. I am so sorry this happened to you, Valerie. Um, and, and reading your, your response, it sounds like there's, there's potentially a, a few things that are bothering you here. Um, and so, you know, first off, you were not provided seating at the fairs and you have to buy your own. This is not appropriate. 
It is not okay that you are not provided um, the equipment that you need to do your job. Even if you were just visiting the fair and you weren't working the fair, it is appropriate to expect seating that accommodates your body. And the fact that you have to go out and buy it is not okay. So for me, I'd already be, I'd be, I'd be cheesed by that. And I, and I know, you know, like it's an investment and you can use it for other fairs and too, but if it was me, I'd already be a bit cheesed. Um, and then on top of it, the seats are expensive, right? So it's not like you're going out and just buying a loaf of bread. These are expensive things. And you mentioned, you know, I, I'm presuming that you're not a multimillionaire and you're not there willy nilly buying chairs every day you know you, that's not something you can do and so that's an investment for you and so for me I'd be annoyed by that too and it's an investment you have to wake make due to an inaccessible world so you know fat phobia and ableism all rolled up into one there and these chairs are important for your comfort and they broke when they shouldn't have um, and your sister-in-law is under the chair's limit, yet they still broke. And I know you mentioned like she was sitting at the front and and that. Like, I'm sure on the box when you bought them, the chairs didn't say, you know, weight capacity this. But make sure you don't lean forward because then they're going to buckle. Make sure you sit squarely in the center and don't move your body. You know, I'm sure that it just said capacity this. And so... They broke when they shouldn't have. You were given, you were sold something that that was faulty. And that's not your fault. And that is annoying. And again, so another another little pile to the annoyed, angry, uh, another bit to that pile. You know, another straw. Uh, And it would be different if, you know, her body size was over capacity and you're like hey sister-in-law there's a chair over there but um, the capacity is this much and she's like I don't fucking care I'm gonna sit on the chair anyway and she sat on it and broke and then she was like haha fuck you I'm not paying for a chair right (laughs) that would be different but um that's not what happened and that doesn't mean that that that's it's your fault you bought the chair with the assumption that it would hold a human's weight (laughs) you know you know, strange. Um, but I think what's really bothering you is that your sister-in-law didn't recognize that this was a big deal for you. And, you know, it doesn't sound like you want her to apologize for the chairs breaking because, you know, you recognize it's not her fault. But maybe for her to recognize that this is a big inconvenience for you. And even if she couldn't afford to help you buy replacements... She could, you know, say, hey, this sucks. I'm sorry this is happening. I would really love to be able to help you to buy replacements, but I'm, 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 I'm unable to. Um, and I'm really sorry that we have to go through this. This is not okay. I think if your sister-in-law said something like that, it wouldn't feel as, as big, I think. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? But because she didn't, then I can see all of these, these, these systemic barriers that are in place added on top added on top added on top and then you don't have someone who is um feeling like they're on your side with this can be like the straw that broke the camel's back right you like for, you know and it feels like that could be what's going on so if this happened to me i was if i was in your sister-in-law's place I would be really angry at the chair manufacturer. Like if I sat in chairs and they broke, I would, I'd be really annoyed with the chair manufacturer. And I'd be like, you know, let's check the capacity here. Um, and then I'd be like, you know what? I'm, le- I'm going to contact them to get them to give us replacements. These motherfuckers are not selling these chairs saying that they're rated to this much. And I happen to sit on it at, towards the fr- front of it and it's buckled. That's fucked up. Um, I would also ask if I could pl- uh, pay to replace them. But also be secretly annoyed that I had to pay for something that wasn't my fault. Um, the whole thing would just be an annoying situation, right? So, um, but, you know, that's what I would do is I'd be like, hey, let me help. Because even though it wouldn't be my fault, I'm involved in the situation, right? If I was your sister-in-law. But that's coming from me, someone who has a certain type of personality, someone who is um, 
in the fat liberation world as a fat activist, right? I'd be able to say, this is fucked up. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. Let's see if we can come together as a team to try and fix it. But maybe your sister-in-law, I can't, I have no idea what type of person she is. She may feel like, hey, I was told these chairs were okay and they broke and that made me feel really embarrassed and angry. And then my sister-in-law, you, seemed angry at me about it, even though she said that she wasn't. So I felt really humiliated and ashamed and I was super stressed and just avoided the whole situation and I hope that she forgets about it and we can just move on. This is a stab in the dark, but I'm just trying to think like, what could be going on in your sister-in-law's head? Or your sister mom will be like, Law might be like, ah, whatever. Maybe she doesn't know that you you don't have money until the end of the month. Maybe she doesn't know you had to ask your mum. Maybe she thinks that the chairs were, you got them for free from somewhere or I don't know. Maybe she doesn't know. But here's the thing. Presuming you want a good and open relationship with your sister-in-law, I would have a conversation with her. Because even, you know, it's bothering you, right? It's bothering you. And sometimes, you know, we can we can talk talk something over with a friend or a therapist or whatever. You know, for me, because I have access to a therapist, I talk to my therapist and I'm like, what do I want to do? Like, is it, you know, is it her I'm angry at? Am I angry at the whole situation or am I angry at... at this fat phobic world am i angry at the the fair for not providing me chairs and like you know what is what is going on here what where are these emotions come from and also anger is really helpful because it t- it tells me that some kind of barrier or a boundary of mine has been crossed you know i don't feel good something something has encroached on my mental well-being and i'm angry and i want to protect myself so that's a good thing right um that you you have that that anger to help direct you to what the problem is and the problem could be just your sister-in-law is just oblivious or your sister-in-law is rude or your sister-in-law is embarrassed or you're you know whatever it is um but the thing is a lot of the times we only know what's going on when we have a conversation with someone and so because this is a sensitive topic right and your sister-in-law might be embarrassed i would gently talk to her and say hey how are you feeling about the fact that the chairs broke Or you can just start and be like, you know what? It was so annoying that those chairs broke when they said the capacity was this and it's inappropriate that they lied about the capacity. That must have been really difficult for you to see the chairs breaking. How do you feel about it? And just see how, how, you know, what what she says and, you know. um, And then you can be like, you know what? I feel really frustrated that I had to buy more. And um, that was really difficult for me, especially because, you know, I had to ask my mum for money and... You know, that didn't make me feel good. And, you know, that was a difficult situation for me. And see what she says. You know, she might be like, oh, I didn't know. Can I contribute towards them? And then you can be like, yeah, no, it's okay. Or you can say, yeah, that would be helpful. Um, Honestly, a lot of these situations, I feel like talking to the person really clears up a lot. And, And you clearly care about your sister-in-law you wouldn't have you wouldn't be thinking about this um you wouldn't have messaged me right so you clearly have have love for her or care for her um and and care for yourself because you're you're providing solutions for yourself so that you have a level of comfort and and safety so which is all all wonderful things right so i mean it makes sense if you you, you're angry it makes sense that you're angry at your sister-in-law it makes sense if you're angry at any of the things that led up to this because it's it's a lot right and if you're working maybe it's hot summer right maybe it's hot maybe it's busy there's probably no air con right because you're probably out out in the open maybe i don't know I don't know. When I think of fair, I just think of Renaissance fair. I just think of being out in a field and people wearing like hats and shit and like drinking out of horns and, you know, wearing wool. (laughs) I don't know if that's what it's like. Could be like any type of fair, but that's what I think about when you say fair. Or a fair could be like, in England, a fair is um, roller coasters and shit. That's what a fair is in, in England. Anyway, which too, that would be, you know, lots of people stressful. So uh, sending lots of love to you, uh, Valerie. And even if you decide, you know what, I'm just going to let it go, whatever. That's fine too. Whatever you decide to do to this situation uh, is, is absolutely fine. And, and you're right to feel the way that you feel. 
Okay, so let's go to a question from Destiny that says, how do I begin exploring gender as a fat person? I'm on the larger in the... I'm on the larger in the fat spectrum and I'm gender queer. I've been thinking about trying some things out, but it feels daunting to figure out where to start. I was assigned female at birth for context, so I like dresses, but I want to try out some masculine stuff too, but it feels a little daunting. Uh, okay, great question from Destiny. I love it. So for me, because I'm uh, non-binary, right? Um, you know what? Like... Recently, I've felt a lot more at home in my gender and I'm trying out more feminine things. Ugh, ugh, I don't even want to say it. I don't like saying that word ugh. And re in regards to me. Like, I feel like it's just m me. Like, it's not feminine. It's just me. But society would say it's feminine. I just feel uncomfortable about the whole thing. Um, so for me, I guess it was a couple of years ago now that I, I came out as non-binary. Um, I would, uh, do thing, do little things that were not so scary because I don't want to go out and, you know, be dressed in a, in a masculine way. Um, because that felt like too much, but you know what, for me, the thing was baseball caps. Uh, so I'd never owned a baseball cap before. So I bought one and, and I know baseball caps, you know, every every gender wears them. But for some reason in my mind, that felt like something powerful, but also something that was easy. And people wouldn't be like, oh, my God, why are you wearing a baseball cap? They'd just be like, oh, there's someone wearing a hat. Um, and putting it on backwards, like that felt like a little bit of mask edge that felt good without being too scary. Other things like underwear. It could be that you decide to try a different style of underwear and like wear like boxers, for example, um, or binding type top for your chest. And it could be that you just do something at home, right? And then when you go out in public, you just dress the way that you normally do. And I think another thing too with being a larger fat person is to also go and find larger fat people who are gender queer or presenting their gender in a way, way that feels more exciting for you. The first person that comes to mind is is Jay from Comfy Fat Travels. I did a whole list of of um, queer fat people. Didn't I shared it on the podcast? Didn't I? Yeah, I did. Let me see if I can find it. Do a search, J, comfy fat. Here we go. Oh, yes, I did. Okay, so episode 164. Yeah, it was only a few episodes. I gave a list of fat, uh, trans, non-binary mask people. Um, and so going to see, just going to look at them visually and they're in the show notes. So if you want to find the links easily, just go to fiercefatty.com forward slash 164. And seeing like how they're presenting themselves and what, what things about, about them um, feels that it might be aligned to you. Um, and it can be just really little things um, and that people don't know. Like, you know, the baseball cap. Like no one would be like, oh, Vinny's ex exploring their gender. They're just like, there's someone wearing a baseball cap. It's, it's no big deal. Or it could be something bigger. Or it could be something like something that's still feminine, but less feminine. You know, like instead of wearing high heels, wearing a flat. You know, not that a flat is less feminine, but um, <laughs> less hyper feminine, I guess. And as well, like other things that you can do is go into, what is that website called? It's the... Uh, Gender, I think it's gender changing room, gender dressing room, gender dressing room. And then you try, you can try on your pronouns, pronoun dressing room. Yeah. Okay. So pronoun, um, pronouns.failedslacker.com. And so you put your name in, you put your, your whatever pronouns that you want to try on, and then they will give you a little story. And so they'll be like, uh, Vinny, he went there and he went and his favorite dog is this and la la la. Um, 
And so that's how I worked out that they then worked on me because I put in some she's because this was when I was still she they. I put in some she's and I put Victoria, which was my which was my past name, and I put in Vinny, which is my name, and um, and then when I read them out, I was like, Bleh. no, I'm a, I'm a they, I'm a, I'm a they. So pronoun dressing room. I put the link for that into the show notes. Yeah, so. It doesn't have to be a big kind of like, hey, here I am, world. And also, it can just be, the thing is with gender, you might try this stuff, you know, you might go try a little bit, a bit more mask stuff and just be like, ugh, you know? And one day you might be like, ugh, I don't like being feminine. And one day you might be like, you know what, I'm I'm cis, you know? And that's the thing, It's, it's just this beautifully evolving thing and you don't have to commit to anything right you could say i'm going to be more masculine today and then tomorrow i'll be hyper feminine and it's all perfect and valid and beautiful and amazing right so that's the, that's the thing that we used to worry me is like well if i do this and i have to commit forever and it, and then if i if i don't feel like it then people will be like you're faking or you're not real you're not a real non-binary person because you don't look like this or do this or whatever that's just, that's all that's all just um transphobia homophobia and bullshit right because we're this ab- beautiful evolving creatures and who knows where the fuck you know i'm gonna end up i've i've identified as non-binary for a couple of years now and it feels great i feel great and i felt a lot more stressed before about it and now i just feel like i feel good i feel more secure in being able to be more feminine but then other days i'll be like ugh, i want to be feminine gross yeah, so much so that I bought myself uh, two dresses a couple of days ago. I sent one back, and I'm, I'm wearing one right now, and it is making me feel it's making me feel a bit funny, to be honest. <laughs> so, but you know, it's an experiment, right? So it could be like you like dresses, but you're going to wear them with um, boxes underneath, or you're going to wear them with I don't know a baseball cap. You might be like baseball caps are not masculine. <laughs> But, you know, for me, that's how my brain goes. Okay, so thank you, Destiny. I hope that helped. Um, And then I'll put the links for those people in the show notes. Uh, Or, yeah, I'll do that. And also, in case I forget, then you've got that. It's 164. Okay, actually, you know what? I'm going to leave it here because I've got a... We have one more question, but it's kind of a... a Kind of a big one. Uh, So we'll leave that for next episode. So only five questions, but if you have a question, feel free to email me and um, we'll do another one next month, next week. If you would like to support me, that would make my little fat heart pitter patter and I would really appreciate it. You can do that by going to Ko-fi and becoming a subscription if you'd like to support me, but without money, you can um, put a review for the podcast. You can send me a nice little message that says, Vinny, you are so sexually attractive. Actually, if you send a message like that, my uh, my VA will probably delete it. <laughs> delete you for being a creep. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Okay, well, thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, whatever you're doing. And remember to stay fierce, fatty, and I will see you in a while, a crocodile. <gasps> Said it. <laughs> Said see you in a while, crocodile. It's alligator. Oh, my goodness. I'm such a silly. See you in a while, alligator. Alligator. I almost said it again. <gasps> anyway, bye. Bye. <laughs>